Hey, you murder phoniacs. This is your host, Tony Siaglia, the serial killer whisperer. It's time to get serious. March is TBI Awareness Month. And boy, do we need to help bring this into the light. Known as the silent epidemic, it is overlooked and misunderstood more than any other serious injury. I've been saying this for the last 30 years. You can't judge a book by its cover. And just because you look okay doesn't mean that you are. Although many people are able to survive a TBI, patients are often faced with long-term disabilities and a decrease in their overall quality of life. Debilitating psychiatric problems are common and equally devastating to the patient. Among them, depression is on the top of the list, followed by anxiety and bipolar disorder. According to studies, there is also an increased risk of alcohol and substance-related problems and suicidal ideation involving families is another important element in recovery. It makes all the difference if a TBI survivor has a strong and understanding support system. I'm going to share this narrative that I wrote titled, Living Life with a Brain Injury. I hope you will listen because it will give you a personal perspective as to what living life with a traumatic brain injury is like. Living life with a traumatic brain injury. I'm brain injured, judged by most as damaged goods. Please get to know me as a person. Love me for who I am. See past my weaknesses not letting my disability define me as a man. Please love me. I don't ask for much. I'm just terrified of being alone. Standing in a crowd, my sight leaves me feeling invisible to their eyes. I stand there with a nice smile, just hoping to get by. Please listen to me. Please hold my hand and tell me everything is going to be okay. I feel so alone, even when I'm in a crowd of people or up on stage in front of hundreds. Like a talking ghost, I go on and on about my life. They think they know me but they can't begin to feel my pain. A heart that's been permanently scarred by a trauma, leaving me with the disease there is no cure for. People say it could be a lot worse, but if they could only be me for one day, they'd last about an hour in my shoes before they ask for a gun and a bullet to put themselves out of their misery. Sometimes, while lying in my bed at night, I find myself staring at the cross on my wall, asking Jesus to take me home. Lord, please lift this burden up off of me, for I cannot stand its weight any longer. Christ, I ask of you to slit a vein and let your holy blood flow down on me from heaven, drenching me in your river of life. As your blood covers me from head to toe, 
I pray that it washes away the burden of pain that weighs down upon me. A weight so heavy, only your touch, my Lord, can dissolve it into ounces, allowing me to move it off my chest so I can breathe again. The pain you went through for me and all my brothers and sisters humbles me. I am only a man created by you in the image of your son, Jesus Christ. I am weak, Father. It can only handle so much. Without you, I am nothing. I see it in your eyes. You're scared of me. Don't make that decision until you come to know me better. The fear you feel towards me is unfair, but unfortunately, life isn't fair, and people have always feared what they don't understand. Don't always listen to your mind, for your mind can sometimes lead you down the wrong path. I only wish more people would use their heart when it came to judging. You look at me and immediately you shun me. All I do is give. I ask for nothing in return. Love, love, love. And when you're done loving, love some more. Even love your enemies, the Christ said to me as he held my hand. I know where I stand with the Lord. If I were to ask you that same question, would you be able to look me in the eyes and not hesitate when you answer? I'm not afraid of where I'm going after this lifetime. Instead of judging me for my decisions, maybe you should take a long look at yourself and what you've done throughout your life. It's always easier to slap judgment on others than to look at yourself in the mirror. I know that the devil's temptation is so potent. You know it's wrong, but the devil is so persuasive. He just knows how to make all the wrongs look so right. This battle of good and evil is nothing new to me. It goes on all the time. There's a constant civil war brewing within me. The battle isn't with others, it's all internal. I wish so much that a peace treaty would be signed and I could live in peace and not have to deal with this inner madness that terrorizes my mind. Sadness, loneliness and depression, triplets of emotional luggage. A disturbing burden that always seems to travel together and hit me at the same time. Even around the people I love, sadness finds a way to spoil the party. I don't invite him in, but when depression knocks at the door, there's no stopping him. Not even a small army can keep him away. I close my eyes when the raging storms collide. I try my hardest to think them away. The wind and the rain are so loud. It's as if someone is screaming in my ears. I cry and I cry in an out of control manner, hoping my dad can hear me. When I was a baby, his voice could always make me stop crying. Now I'm a grown man, and I want to thank you, my hero, for no matter how bad things get, you can always take me out of the eye of the storm. This life that we're blessed with, you only get one shot at. You take the hand you're dealt, and you make do. Some of us have disabilities, and this is a rough journey we walk. And there are no promises in the beginning that we will make it to the end unscathed. I will always be friendly and helpful if I 
can help someone out. I believe we all need a little help to get by in this difficult, often very complex world. I am who I am and I wouldn't change who I am for the world. Sometimes all somebody needs is a compliment or smile along with a little upbeat conversation to change their entire day around. Do I worry about the future? Hmm. The fear I have for the future paralyzes me. Sure, I have my ups and downs, but in order to function in a society that sometimes doesn't understand me, I will always try to walk in the calm after the storm. My name is Tony Siaglia, and I live every day with a severe traumatic brain injury. Written by Tony Siaglia, August 9th, 2013. Well, as we like to say on Murder Phone, that will get you as close to a traumatic brain injury as you ever want to be. <laughs> Thanks for listening, and please stay tuned for my University of Wisconsin presentation. I think you will enjoy it. If you want to check out the younger, hotter version of myself, watch it on YouTube. What? Wait a second. Huh. <laughs> I'm still pretty fucking hot and wiser with age, of course. Back then, I was hot, but youthfully naive. <laughs> it's a whole different experience. Take care. Stay safe, you guys. And remember, always walk in the calm after the storm. switch gears to a story about a young man who cheated death after being in a horrible accident. But what does his recovery have to do with serial killers? That doesn't make any sense, does it? As a teenager, I was very athletic. I had lots of friends. When I was 15 years old, I was at summer camp. I was standing in the water when all of a sudden a jet ski came in going 45 miles an hour, striking me in the back of the head. He was careflighted. His heart stopped and they had to bring him back. When he did get to the trauma center, he lapsed into a coma for over 30 days. Before the accident, he wasn't aggressive at all. Uh, after the accident, he was a changed person. He was volatile, he was aggressive. You could see an actual uh, curtain go down past his eyes and it would be like he didn't even know who he was talking to. Tony couldn't name the four seasons of the year. If you put the seven days of the week up on a board in a jumbled order and ask him to put it in order, he wasn't capable of doing that. And it was very difficult to watch. Over the past 15 years, I had made great strides physically, but um, emotionally, mentally, caused me to live sort of reclusive. Six years ago, I was seeing a psychologist. He says to me, Tony, you really need a hobby. And I have great interest in um, notorious figures, crime, such as serial killers. Why don't I try and reach out to these people and, and see if I can get some kind of response? I sent out a mass mailing and I received 33 responses from murderers and serial killers. I've received thousands of letters and probably over 250 art pieces one serial killer ripped out his molar and sent it to me. I have been through so many mental and physical struggles. One thing that I have learned throughout all of this is never give up hope. 
That was Tony. We were very fortunate to have him here with us, along with neurosurgeon Dr. Ian Armstrong. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. And Tony, I'm fascinated that you have begun communicating with serial killers, <laughs> and, and it's become something that you do on a regular basis. That's correct. Um, it started out as a hobby from my psychologist told me, Tony, you know, you need a hobby. So I kicked it around a little bit and I was always interested in criminology and like notorious serial killers. I was like, I wonder, is it possible that I could reach out to these people? And that's exactly what I did. Because of this accident and the isolation you felt after it, you're communicating with them and they're telling you secrets. They're telling you things that have helped you help the, the police solve murder mysteries. Cold cases became a big thing for me and still is to this day. I have um, been able to solve a cold case in Alaska and uh, I'm also working on some other ones right now with the uh, National Federation of Missing and Exploited Children. You have found a way to turn this change, this, this brain injury, into something that is not, it started off as a hobby, but now you're actually helping people solve murders. Exactly. And, and Dr. Armstrong, if we may, we're going to go over to the magic wall. Let's talk a little bit about what happens during a traumatic brain injury so everyone at home can understand how this happens. It's so fascinating because a lot of people don't understand, and Tony's friends abandoned him because they did right. not understand why he was going through these personality changes. So let's just right. walk through, first of all, what happens during a severe traumatic brain injury. When the head moves forward suddenly in an accident and then backwards, the brain, since it's floating or suspended, then bounces back, if you will, and causes what we call a contra -coup injury, an injury on the opposite side where, again, the brain floats back and hits against the hard skull, causing damage to the brain cells. And it may just be a mild concussion that you experience, but in some cases, if it's a severe blow to the head, you end up with multiple injuries in the brain. Yes. And what's going on inside the nerve cells? Well, there are 100 billion nerve cells, what we call gray matter in the brain. These nerve cells are connected by axons, these pathways that you see. These axons interconnect the gray cells, and really this is where we live. This is our personality in the, the brain cells. And so these axons are communicating, sending uh, electrical impulses, if you will. Um, and when those impulses or when these axons are injured in a high-speed in incident, as Tony had, then they die off. The brain can't communicate. So all those connections, those memories, they are no longer occurring in the brain. And that's why your personality, your sure. memories can all change. Absolutely. And the brain actually begins to atrophy in those regions? The brain can shrink up. And there's also injury that may not be picked up by MRI or CT scan, where uh, even the cytoskeletal structures, the cell structures are damaged that you can't even see. In Tony's case, we have his MRI scans that will explain to everyone at home why he, he dealt with some of these memory deficits, personality changes. So yes. This is his MRI. This is Tony's MRI. And uh, to, to look at an MRI, let me orient you first. Obviously, here's the eyes up here, the nose. So Tony's looking that way. And uh, one of the best ways to see a problem with an MRI is look at the normal side first. We see nice gray matter over there. The dark areas that are symmetrical are normal. Those are ventricles or fluid. Now we look at normal and we can come across here and clearly see some dark areas here. These darkened areas in the brain are the atrophy that we saw in our animation. This is brain damage. Uh, we may see personality problems, uh, cognitive problems, thinking problems. Uh, there may be things such as uh, rage, aggression, things like that, uh, memory problems, uh, inability to do uh, even normal daily tasks, becoming apathetic, withdrawn, social cues may be lost, uh, people can become uh, uh, withdrawn, as perhaps in Tony's case. Tony, you have a question. Yeah, I would just like to add, I don't look like there's anything wrong with me. I, I don't look like I suffered a traumatic brain injury, a severe traumatic brain injury. But what's wrong with society is when they see somebody with a cast or they see somebody in a wheelchair or on crutches, they know that that person has had an injury <clears throat> and is disabled. Me, on the other hand, they don't know. 
So it kind of goes that whole thing, you can't judge a book by its cover. Because you don't know what's going on inside this person's... Listen to, listen to this man. That is so well put, Tony. Thank you. So well put. Thank you. And that's the beauty of having MRIs, because we can yeah. show everyone exactly what's going on. And, and the, the takeaway for people who've suffered from brain injuries or their friends or caregivers is that you can never predict what the personality changes are going to be. But if it's a severe enough injury, the one thing you can predict is that there will be changes. Yes. And you have to work with that individual. And in Tony's case, your parents, Al. Unbelievable. And Chris, they are here. Your brother, Joey. If it wasn't for them and the 17 pill cocktail I have to take every single day, <laughs> I would be either dead, in jail, or in a mental facility. Because your friends gave up on you, but your family didn't. And wow. Al, as a father, yeah. what is that like to see your previously healthy, popular son ignored? It was terrible. I mean, it got to the point where you know, he was on suicide watch, he had a nervous breakdown, and he had to be with us 24 hours a day or being in a hospital. So it was very difficult times. And, and this is why you never give up on a brain injury victim, because as Tony has proven, it takes time, years and years, to get to a place yes. where you, you are an intelligent person and oh, you are offering you. so many things to this world. Tony, keep up all the great work, okay? Thank, thank you for you. sharing your story. Thank you. We really appreciate it. My name's Joey Siaglia. I was on the video. I think you saw me, but I had a, I think, a late Vegas night before they came, and I was a little bit hungover in that. Uh, you guys are in for a real special treat today. Uh, obviously, you're here for a reason. You all either love serial killers, criminology, or you just like to learn some new things. So hopefully, you're going to walk away with something from this. Um, the young guy that's going to be speaking here today is really an inspiration to me. He's been on one hell of a ride through his life. Uh, you got to see a little bit of, a, uh, of, of what he's been through on this video. Um, but he's an inspiration to me, and I really hope that after you hear his story, he becomes an inspiration to you. And I hope that you can take something from this that if you do come in contact with people that have disabilities or you know somebody that has a head injury, just try to be a little bit more patient with them because it means a lot. Uh, they always say when you come across somebody that had a crazy life that they should write a book. How many people in here have ever heard somebody say that? Oh, I should write a book about my life. Well, that's exactly what he did because he's had such a crazy life that his life story was told in the book, The Serial Killer Whisperer. He was pronounced dead three different times on the care flight helicopter when they were flying him to the hospital. But he's here today to share this journey with you. So what we like to say in our family, from coma to cold cases, it gives me great pleasure to introduce one of my heroes and my brother, Tony Siaglia. University of Wisconsin, yeah! <laughs> My brother, I had to pay him for him to say I was his hero <laughs> to get into that. Everybody, this is no lie. On that jo the doctor show, um, the blonde guy, Travis, the host, on my fan page, over a hundred girls wrote to me and told me to get his digits for them. <laughs> I know, and that's no joke. But my brother wanted them. <laughs> Everybody, I want to um, talk to you a little bit more about what the doctor's show doesn't talk about. When I try to come back to a society that just didn't accept me, and it was very hard for me to handle because... I was a star athlete in my town, basketball, football, and um, I was also a uh, big time drama guy. I was into plays and speech tournaments and stuff like that. So I had friends in all different cliques. But when I came back to school, that was gone, all of it. I walked 
my high school, like Casper the ghost. I was ostracized by all of my friends, not one, not two, every single one of them. I was teased. I was bullied. And this is even the worst. I can handle the teasing. I can handle the bullying. But I was spit on by people I had called my friends since I was four years old. It was very hard. I had a nervous breakdown. My parents had to pull me out of public high school. I, had to, I was on 24 hour a day suicide watch. I had to sleep on their bedroom floor for a year and a half on a mattress. Well, living with TBI has really changed my life every way. I am 100% different than I was before my accident. Let's say before my accident, I was shy. I was. Now I'm up in front of however many of you are out there and I'm not nervous at all. It's, it's amazing how my entire personality changed. I went from shy to quite the extrovert. And confusion and anger of not fitting into my life really consumed me. This is what got me through. My family, well, you have Elvis up there at the top, and I, I was really a pioneer of the whole thing because nowadays for TBI, it's really important that they play music and they do it for autistic children now too. Uh, music is a big, a big um, thing in therapy. It wasn't back in 1992, so I was kind of a pioneer. Yeah. And my parents played Elvis for me, and I kind of, I became an Elvis impersonator. And I became ranked like in the top 10 in the world two years in a row at this uh, famous contest that they have in uh, Memphis every year. And it also gave me time to sit down at my kitchen table and lose myself in writing. I wasn't a writer before my accident, but I had a lot of creative thoughts. And this is before the serial killers. But my family, my family and medicine is what has gotten me through and gotten me to this point in my life. Because every time I fell down, these two guys and my mom have been there to pick me up and push me on my way. And those three guys in the lower right, big noses and lots of hair, they're still with the family and it's amazing how close you can get to an animal. But uh, they're wonderful dogs. And then, and then you got me down here doing Elvis. I'm the guy on the left. I lost a lot of weight since you've seen me, uh, since you see me up here. Um, actually, that guy just passed away recently. His name is Johnny Hara. He was like the king of Elvis impersonators. Next. Here they are. This is my, my cocktail of medicine that I take up to date. I take 17 pills a day to make me live a semi-normal life. Before this, it was like a roller coaster of emotions. It was horrible. Rage, aggression. And this has seemed to level me out quite well. Sure, I live with side effects, but the side effects are a lot better than being in prison, being dead, or, uh, well, 
living in a mental institution where I'd be if it wasn't for these drugs and my family. I just want to point out in my book that Pete Early, the author, he, he uh, took a lot of literary license in, um, in writing it. I never had thoughts of being a serial killer, okay? That's crazy. I didn't ever send pictures of my ex-girlfriend to the serial killers. Now that she's an ex-girlfriend, I kind of wish I would have. <laughs> but I never did. Traumatic brain injury didn't leave me with traits of a serial killer, which also is written in the book. And I, I, I'm not friends with these people. They think I'm their friend. Because if I told them I wasn't, what kind of information are they going to give me, right? It's kind of like I'm an undercover cop in a way. Kind of. <laughs> this has become a joke in my family, and kind of with other brain-injured survivors. You might be sitting next to your friend, and I might say a word. And you might look at your friend and say, Wow, this guy's really smart. I never even heard of that word. You know why you never heard of that word? Because that word doesn't exist. It's a brain injury word. Now, people that are closest to me and my friends, my family, they know what I'm trying to say, so it works out. They call it the brain injury dictionary. <laughs> This is perfect for this time of year because Halloween is tomorrow. I know you're missing a great party in Vegas, but you know, you're here, buddy. <laughs> Supporting me, because I'm your hero, remember? <laughs> Let's see it. Okay. Now this is just a, a piece of artwork out of the hundreds of pieces of artwork that I have from serial murderers. This is a guy who's a serial killer in Florida on death row, Glenn Rogers. He doesn't talk to me anymore because my book got somebody else executed on death row in the same prison. I can't figure that one out, why he wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> but unlike Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger and Jason and Dexter, Although it's a great show, it's very fake. There are monsters that walk amongst us. And these are the people who we're gonna focus on tonight. And um, the guy on the top left is David Gore. He's, he's the one that just got executed because of my book. And that's why Glenn Rogers stopped writing me. And then the guy to the right is the psycho sailor. His name is um, Eric Armstrong. And then on the bottom, you know when People Magazine does the 50 most beautiful people? Well, that's where I took that clipping from right there. That's Joseph Matheny. He's the guy who ripped out his tooth and he sent it to me in the mail. He told me, in case you never get to visit me, Tony, I want you to have a piece of me to carry around with you forever. Come on, I'm not carrying it with me. It's in a shed, and in an envelope. The guy on the top is Arthur John Shawcross. He died two months after we visited him in New York. Now, this is probably the most outrageous visit because of what I'm gonna tell you. It, it was the most outrageous visit that I've, I've ever had with, a, with a, a serial killer because he looks like a grandfatherly kind of guy, right? Like, like the old guy living across the street. Well, that's the mask he wears when he sat down with us at our table. He was two feet in front of me. And when we started to talk about the crimes, he left that cafeteria 
and he went back to the scene of the crime. He had fake teeth in his mouth, and he started to sweat on his forehead profusively, and he was blinking his eyes really fast, and he took out his teeth, and he threw them on the table, and he goes, and you know what I did to this lady after I killed her? We're just like in total awe, awestruck. No, I took a knife, and I... I cut her vagina out, and I pulled it by the hair, and I ripped it out, and I ate it from the inside out. I ate the whole thing. He was sweating, and it was dripping off of his forehead. His teeth were on the table, and he's staring at us in a totally different zone. And then he says, and you know what I did after that? I went to Dunkin' Donuts and I washed it down with coffee black, of course. And we had nothing to say. Well, yeah, what do you say to that? I mean, that's something that's not really told to you very often. And then he starts laughing like, like it was nothing. And. I just want to point out the fact that they wear masks when they're out walking amongst us. Like this guy on the bottom. He's alive still and I still speak with him. He calls me every two weeks from uh, Michigan. He is the most traveled serial killer in history. He was in the Navy for five years and the different ports that they would go to. He would get off the ship, he would go to where prostitutes were, he would take one, he would murder, then he would get back on the ship. Sometimes he would murder two in a port. This guy, he's the nicest guy in the world. I'm 36 years old, he's about to be 40. He's a couple years older than me. And everybody, on, you're gonna see him in a second, he, a better picture of him than that right there. He looks like Opie. And people were interviewed. I've interviewed people that were on the ship with him. And they said that, uh, no, Eric Armstrong was, was the nicest guy in the world. Your parents would love you to have a great friend like him. Now you're going to hear him explain to me how you murder somebody. Does it take a long time to take someone's life? No. No, it doesn't. Pretty quick? Uh, when, you, when you choke somebody, right? Yes, with your hands. That's 30 seconds, all you need to make a person pass out. Okay. And but are they gone then? No. They're, they're, all it does is uh, uh, deprive the brain of oxygen. Okay. So it makes them go unconscious. Now, if you keep your hands on the on the, the artery, uh, both arteries, and stop the blood flow, then it becomes brain death, which within a minute, the it. brain will die. He refers to it. Oh, oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. So. But it's not like it is on TV. No. You, you know, the fucking people die like in 10 seconds. No. Yeah. No. It takes 30 seconds for, for you to, for the person to pass out from strangulation. Mm -hmm. And it takes like a minute, minute to five minutes to kill a person, actually. And then the problem is that you've got this body in your car. Okay, that's why you dump the body out right where you're at and take off. <laughs> you like that laugh? It's pretty sinister. Now, I know everybody in this room is sitting there going, I've never heard anybody confess to me on how you murder somebody. And you probably never will hear anybody say that to you again. I'm sorry. It even takes me sometimes, and I've heard this a hundred times. It's, um, you talk to these people on the phone, and their, their respect for human life isn't there at all. 
I say to him, I say, how do you go out and kill somebody? And then you go home and you kiss your little boy goodnight, you tuck him in, you lay down with your wife in bed, you give her a hug, you tell her you love her. And he says, well, first off, I don't tell her I love her because she's a piece of shit. Second off, if I would have had a chance, I would have killed my wife, but she's the mother of my children, so that's the one reason I didn't do it. And I'm like, wow, that's big of you. She said, when my book came out, there was a, a detective in Detroit who was shooting his mouth off saying, eh, there's no evidence that he ever killed outside of um, Detroit. Uh, you're gonna hear that right now. Nothing ever came to the plate um, on crimes that you did in other countries. No. Okay. No. So. But you say there were. Yes, there were. I'll admit that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where you started, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I was going to ask you about doing it in another country. What you do? Get off the boat? Uh, go to a place where there was a prostitute? Basically. And because you had, you couldn't have done it in the whorehouse. You'd have to take her off the premises right. and do it. Right. And leave her and then get back on the boat. Right. Okay. I just wanted to get that clear because I was sitting there thinking to myself, how did he pull that off? Right. That's how it is. I mean, you just go in there. They're, they're, they're everywhere. And, uh -huh. you know, wherever I was at, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, whatever. Yes. So. And those women are all so subservient. They'll do anything a man says. Yes, they do. Yes, they will. Yeah. And some are sold into slavery because of the family's addiction to drugs. There's yeah. In Thailand, a uh, going hunting. Yeah, going hunting. Yeah. Human hunting. Yeah, basically. Human hunting. Um, he has a great relationship with his parents. He wasn't... He wasn't, well, I take that back. His, he was molested a lot by his real father, but his, his adopted father and his mother, they support him all the way. They give him money in prison. And it's, that's kind of rare because all the other ones that I've worked with, they, um, I mean, their families just leave them completely. I'd like to um, explain now a little bit about how I got into cold case working. And it all started with Robert Hansen, a very uh, notorious killer in Alaska. Alaska, he's the worst serial killer in Alaskan history. A movie just recently came out with uh, Nicolas Cage and John Cusack. Frozen, on fro no, Frozen Ground is what the movie was called. And, I was writing to uh, Robert Hansen, and he told me that, um, you know, he stopped the friendship immediately and just gave, gave me to one of his cellies. And I started writing him. And then the cellie came with, to me with information that he wanted to solve one of the cold cases with me that Robert Hansen had murdered this girl named Me Megan Emmerich, a 17-year-old, back in uh, 1973. I, I agreed with him that I would help any way I could. I took all my information after years of dealing with this guy to the National Center for Missing and Exploit. No, no, first I went to the Seward Police in Alaska. And um, then they gave me to these people here. And um, they sent two investigators out to my house, and they did. They returned two other times, so a total of three times. I gave them all the letters that he had written me, the location where the body is, and the guy's an artist. And let's go to the next slide. The guy's an artist, so he would paint clues too. That's Robert Hansen up there, and Megan Emmerich is in um, his left lens, and then he's hunting her. 
and you could only fly to this cabin. You could fly or take a boat to this cabin. It's like way out there in the middle of nowhere. And um, that's where he took a lot of the women and he would, he would rape them and hold them for like a week to two weeks. Then he would let them go and he would hunt them down like animals. He was a hunter and he would bury them out there. And um, the clues are in the paintings. And next one, Joe. And this one he's trying to hint too. I mean, another cabin way out there um, in the middle of nowhere. I'm unfortunately still waiting for the National Center for Missing and Exploited uh, Children. They work real slow. Um, all right, you know that, that, that slob you saw earlier and he's cut and, okay, well that was him before prison, okay? There he is, Joe Matheny. And that right there was his girlfriend who was a stripper and that's the strip club that she worked in and he met her there, he was a bouncer and she was the mother of his son. This is how Joe Matheny looked in 2010 when me and my dad and Pete Early, when we went to go visit him. We wanted to feed Pete Early to him. Uh, Joe discussed with us um, his barbecue stand that he, he fed uh, the public human flesh, flesh with his pork sandwiches, and how the only women he could have sex with were dead women. And he also shed several cold cases with me. And we were the only visitors he's ever had in prison. All those bitches I killed had one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. As you can see, the man was not very religious. This is how Jesus helps the prostitutes to earn their wings. And, you know, he would send me, I have a notebook about this thick of hundreds of drawings from this man. And he would draw on the uh, envelopes, stuff like this. I always wondered how the envelopes would get through the mail. Oh, and he, he would always sign his name and then he would prick his finger and then put a thumbprint of blood on it. He gave me the locations of uh, where um, three different bodies were. He confessed to 10 unsolved murders in the six years that I was um, corresponding with him a lot. And he, he told me this about um, being a necrophiliac. I asked him, what's it like to have sex with a dead girl? And he goes, it's kind of a dead lay. And then he said, it's not so bad though. You get used to the smell and you push the maggots out of the way. And he goes, dig in. And he goes, and Tony, I'm gonna give you some advice. And I'm like, I'm gonna use this advice. He goes, go, go to your local funeral parlor and palm the, um, the guy who's working a graveyard shift, palm him a hundred dollar bill, he'll open up any of the slabs and you can just go to work. It's great, you don't have to kiss him afterwards, you don't have to take him out to dinner. So he gave exact instructions on where he buried his first victim. She was a 12 year old girl. He committed his first murder when he was 15 years old. He, uh, he kind of, he, she got off a bus, he thought she was a runaway. And he lured her back into the, like a wooded area by the interstate. And he anally raped her and regular a vaginal rape. And then he took a rock and he beat her head in. And then he buried a hole. He buried her in a hole and he used that rock to, um, be her headstone. And every year on the anniversary of that murder, he would get a six pack of beer 
and he would go masturbate on the grave and drink the beer. Victims under the bridge. This was um, Joe Matheny. He, um, he went under this bridge, and I'm gonna show you under this bridge, where his wife left him, and he, um, she took his kid, he went down there, and he brought a case of beer, because there were a couple of bums down there, and they were talking uh, smack about his wife and having sex with his wife, so he got them drunk, he took a hatchet, and he cut both of their heads off clean from the middle across, and he left those bodies there. So he got arrested, and he did, he did 18 months, but um, then he got out and he went to court. They couldn't prove it, so he, got, he was freed. And um, well, when they uh, freed him, he went right back to work. He lured two prostitutes under that same bridge, actually one at a time. One, he killed her, had sex with her dead body, brought the second one down there. He had murdered her and was having sex with her dead body and a, a poor street person happened to come to the wrong place at the wrong time. So he took a pipe and he beat that man to death. He cut them up and um, he dropped them in the bottom of the river and the, the tide took them out. Kind of Dexter's trick. And that was the first time he ever tasted human flesh. One of those girls, he was sitting there by the fire under this bridge, at this bridge. And he started a fire and he's like, I wonder what human flesh tastes like. So when he cut her arm off, he cooked it and he, he ate it. It tastes like pork. So when he went to prison, he was in court. And most people, when they address the court, oh, I was kind of crazy when I committed those murders. Well, this is how he addressed the court. Now comes the person that you are here for, Kathy Magaziner. The part they left out was that after six months, I dug her skull up, washed out the maggots, and fucked it. That's sick, ain't it? She was just another piece of meat upon the street. The words I'm sorry will never come out, for they would be a lie. I am more than willing to give up my life for what I have done, to have God judge me and send my ass to hell for eternity. There is no excuse for the things that I have done to those people. I just enjoyed it. So I ask of you, please give me the fucking death penalty. The FBI thinks there are over 200 serial killers walking around at any given point in our country. So, who knows? Maybe there's one next to you right now. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.